thank you so much for doing this again. We've already had one failed attempt. I've heard second time's always mm-hmm. luckier. So this should sound, this should, this should be fun. For I'm sure, for with, sure. I'm here with ABNUX, as, as it is popularly known. Um, <laughs> and, and in the human world, he's called Abhinav Shikara. And why I make the distinction between the human world and I'd say the digital or the virtual world is going to become clearer as we go on and talk about the different subjects we want to talk about. So Abhinav, you know, at the cost of repetition, I'll begin where we began the last time. Yeah. Because both of us have um, a very mature understanding that we're not going to talk about design. Mm. Um, that the journalists, other people, people on your Telegram and your Instagram and your Twitter haunt you enough about design. So I'm going to haunt you about different things. Cool. And I'm nice. going to start with this idea that, you know, I came across as um, uh, an idea I came across as a, as a consequence of hanging out with you, which was... Um, space being fake and it's, yeah. it's it has had me baffled sin so mm. tell me how is bloody space fake think about this right throughout our entire childhood what was this one thing that we've all had in common we've always looked up we've looked up at space and we've been like whoa dude like i want to be an astronaut or i want to i wonder what's out there right space has been this canvas on which we've projected a lot of our unknown hopes, hopes that we didn't know how to put a picture or word to, we look out at space and we're like, yeah, it's out there. And uh, it has been that way for most of human history, but especially in the last uh, century, it's gotten a little bit more realer, which is Hmm. we've got the, we had the moon landings. We had all of the space missions. um, And I think today, right? After, you know, maybe it's how many years has it been since the moon mission, maybe 50 or 50 plus at least 50, right? 50 plus. Yes. 69, the idea of space. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably mm-hmm. the idea of space doesn't right. appeal to me as much. Um, because mm-hmm. the things that we were hoping out of space, it's getting a little more bleaker in my opinion. Mm-hmm. So, The way I think about it is that age, that was the space age that a lot of people lived through. And we, um, our childhood was sort of the ending of that space age, the new age that we're in, the thing we're going to be pinning our hopes to, it's the simulation age, Mm. which is space is just blankness out there, which is we have an empty, vast area, uh, most of which actually doesn't exist. It's blank space. It's rendered when you look at it. Uh, That's just my opinion, Uh, Mm. but a way more interesting topic to me or one that helps shock people into this by using the space as fake um, sentence is that we're living in the simulation age. The question isn't about what's out there in space. It's what's in here, which is the nature of Mm. the reality that we live in right now. Uh, Mm. The simulations we are a part of and the simulations we will be a part of. Right. So from what it seems like within the explicit claim that space is fake, there is a more important implicit claim that we might not be living in the reality. And this might not be, let's say this, the, this first approximation, this might be a first approximation of reality. This might not be a real reality. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea, but I, it begs the question. Do you think the who's who of our intellectual entrepreneurial world, People like Elon Musk, people at NASA, people at Israel, people at whatever space organizations, the Cold War. You think yeah. all of that was a futile attempt? Like, it, do you do you lend no credibility to these people and these events? It's definitely not a futile attempt because space will exist when you interact with space, right? Hmm. Um, speaking hmm. in a very uh, quantum physics type of way, which is you have the Earth and then you have you have these parts of space that we have looked into. And every time we look into it sort of generated. Um, Mm. And of course, the more you look, the more you try to establish stuff, um, space actually does expand. The more we look out into space and do stuff. Uh, Mm. But to me, right, I am not a conspiracy theorist, although I would be okay with people. I'd call you that. I would be okay with people (laughs) dismissing me as one because I'm not trying to convince anybody. Right. To me, it's about me as an individual. I'm going to get nothing out of space, which is Mm. me as an individual. Space is fake is also a metaphor to me Mm. to not look externally for things that I'm looking for, uh, to not leave the things that I'm looking for to an externality, which is space, 
but to mm. actually look right here, mm. uh, which is the meaning that we're looking for is not out there. It's in here and in here. Okay. Yeah. So th- at this point, uh, you sort of intersect into what I would arrogantly call my domain. I'd mm. be less humble when I'd say psychology, meaning questions of meaning and such uh, is, is something that I have particularly spent my time wondering about. And your claim is, let's say it's approximately true. And Zima mm. Blue was was one thing that people from your group started yeah, yeah. floating around and I, and I saw Zima Blue and, I, and I'd use the same analogy to explain what what how meaning is found, not exactly inside it's mm. found in proximity. It's not out there, bloody floating in gaseous, nebulous masses. It's it's somewhere around. But mm. the the idea is that um, our sense of self, which has a very strong tie with our sense of meaning, yeah. is constantly externalized in actions. Mm. Humans are what biologists call the extended phenotype animal, which mm. is essentially that we because our bodies are limited, but our range of adaptation is so profoundly wide, we take things on the inside. Warren made a very interesting video about how artists and engineers are sort, you know, we take things on the inside yeah. and we manifest them outside. So this component of meaning, even though it begins somewhere here, just like it does for Zima, it has to manifest outside. And it might be that the full circle of things, you know, like the Buddhist idea of things, that the full circle of things brings you back on the inside and nothing's on the outside. But what I would call that is sort of like a necessary detour that you have to sort of explore like Zima does in Zima Blue. You sort of have to explore on the outside. But it also makes me wonder because I'm, I might not be as well read on quantum physics as you are, but it, there seems to be an implicit assumption that's hidden within the idea as to what observation means. From what I gather, physicists are not certain about what observation means okay. in, 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 in like human language. In mathematics, they sort of know, you know, you apply this matrix, mm. blah, 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 mathematical function, but it's not clear in human language what observation means. So when you assume that observation is plain me looking at you or whatever, whatever, mm. uh, how does that work? Like, it, it, don't you think it's a little quick for us to assume that space is entirely unrendered video game simulation, you know? Yeah. So I think there's two views on this again. One of them is the game type of view, which is if you're in a certain point on the map, the whole map is not rendered. It's right. the point that's relevant to you right now that is rendered. And the points that are relevant to other characters also playing the game. Let's say it's an it's a multiplayer game with multiple people, it's locally Mm. rendered for each of them. So in this case, they would sort of be the observers. Mm. Um, Although there is another view, which is that um, the whole universe itself is actually observing itself, Mm. which is, which then would mean that all of space is sort of rendered. Uh, But beyond that, it's about the universe is experiencing itself through us, right? Mm. Which is a very philosophical take as well. Right. Um, And I think both are pretty valid, but I think one, this is probably a good segue into what is consciousness, right? So I would Mm. say anything that has consciousness is an observer. So Mm. uh, that then gets into the domains of human consciousness is very different, let's say, from an animal's consciousness, Mm. which is very different from a plant's consciousness. And this Mm. is subjective reality of what it's like to be a human. Mm. Um, between the two of us as well, what it's like to be Prakhar, what it's like to be Abhinav. Mm. Uh, but then I would say that's the observer I'm referring to. Right, right, right. So I, so there is an assumption built in there from what I gather. And, yeah. and right. It's, you know, you're right. Consciousness is such a tricky subject to pick upon. And I, and I, and I feel like it would almost inevitably happen in our conversation as we move forward. Because uh, I was speaking to my, my roommate the other day and we were talking about this very commonly discussed phenomenon of care qualia, which is essentially, do I see the same red as you see? We both call it red, but is it the same red? And philosophers have tried to, you know, Mm. go about that question in so many ways. And they've tried to inject biology, but we have no, like we have no philosophical grounding of anything at all. In fact, I think uh, one of the qualms that I have with philosophy, philosophy was very well put by Novel. And Novel says that any question that begins with why, which is essentially the foundation of philosophy ends in one of these three ways. And that's either circular reasoning, right? A is equal to B because B is equal to A, infinite regress or an axiom. And that axiom then again dictates that you must have faith in that axiom. So that's exactly why I'm not as militant about the fact that you have a science fiction theory, which is based on some sort of faith. But tell me, how is it that you, somebody who's playing with colors and forms and and images and experiences and, and interfaces, 
I mean, actually, I can see the sense, but how is it? What was the bridging link into starting to wonder about this macro question of what your reality might be? Hmm. I think for me, so some background context. Um, I went to college for computer science. Uh, the reason I sort of did this was solely based on the idea that I wanted to create stuff, but I didn't know what was the range of creation possible. It's a very vague way to say it, but I watched the social network, the movie, and I was like, shit, dude, I totally want to do this. Like, this is exactly what I imagine myself doing. So I got into computer science. Um, a few years in, I realized that what we were doing with computer science, the things that they were teaching us, which is in an Indian computer science college, but I'm sure this is true anywhere. It was more about the technicalities of how to do certain things, but it was never a question of why should you do it this way? Mm -hmm. Or for example, like you could build Facebook. Somebody else could also build something which is very close to it, but only one of them could win. Mm -hmm. Or for example, um, a very recent example would be, let's say Snapchat. Snapchat um, sort of invented this format of stories, right? Mm. And if you think about it, all apps have this, have access to the same primitives, which is you have photos, you have text, you have videos, you have sound. Mm. Uh, before Snapchat, the way you would send photos is probably through WhatsApp or iMessage. Mm. Snapchat created this whole thing around it where it's a, uh, it's disappearing. You can add additional context, like filters about time and location on top of it. And it, made sending images back and forth really quick. So they sort of discovered a new way to communicate, mm. right? This is not the kind of stuff you would be learning about in computer science, mm. right? Computer science would be about how do you send an image across? What are the protocols that, you know, dictate that dictate how this flows? Like what are the API calls that you do? You would do to authenticate a user and then send this photograph. And I was like, dude, this is not for me. And, and that's sort of when I discovered what design was, which is mm -hmm. the layer above this, which is figuring out what, do you, what should you build now that you can build anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of got me started on this journey of like just creating stuff. Um, and I don't think there was like this one aha moment, which is like, whoa, like I've been creating things and the universe is a simulation, bro. Like right. it was just a <laughs> bunch of, <laughs> it was just a bunch of, the more you create, you're like, okay, let's push this further. Right. I've been mm. making screens. Let's make an app. Now I've made this mm. app. This app makes money. Let's do something else. Now let's, you know, work at startups. Let's do this for other people. And eventually you're just like, what's the, what, what are the big questions in life? Mm. <laughs> so it's sort of a journey like that. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's, it's, it's good, you know, because I bumped across these big questions in life without having to go through what I would now say are necessary detours like financial stability, social stability, mm. you know, all those things are very, very for important sure. before. And I was lucky and to use here, even though I'm militantly against the free use of the word privilege, but I was very privileged in the sense my parents provided for me very well. I was on a steady track to finish my chartered accountancy. I never liked it. And from there, the defection happened into answering the questions of the nature of why, because I was not happy with my present reality. I started contemplating that as a whole. And then, you know, I started poking holes and, 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 and thinking about all of this. But I remember distinctly in my journey, there were points, or in fact, I'd say large periods of time where I felt absolutely structureless. And what I mean by that essentially, as soon as I sort of give up on the idea that any of this is real, I incur the risk of not believing in anything at all. Like, you know, the, 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 the proper idea of nihilism sort of takes over. Has that happened with you? Do you find that the, the first flirtations that you can have with this idea of our, the nature of our reality being far different than what we perceive brings with it the risk of crushing nihilism. Yeah. There's definitely a risk of it because, um, which is one of the reasons I say that I'm not trying to convince anybody that we're in a simulation, right? Because I don't re it's like, it's like a spoiler alert, right? Mm. If a spoiler alert, that might not be true. Like, I don't want to tell you, bro, you're in a simulation. Like, don't do that or don't do this. <laughs> right. right. That would make me a dick. Right. Right. Firstly, I wouldn't do that myself either. Like I'm mm. still going to be hundred percent involved in all the things that I'm doing, or uh, all the games that I want to play on this mega game, uh, that I'm on. Right. Um, but I guess it's about the nihilist outcome is definitely a possibility. Mm. Um, I have faced it at some level, uh, but I think 
the way to break out of it is that from let me give you a game metaphor right mm-hmm. if you're playing gta uh, you're playing any game the way to stop playing the game is not to kill yourself in the game right like you would just respawn the point is you're playing the game because you want to play the game right otherwise you would just switch off your computer you would switch off the console so the fact that i'm here right now means at some level i do want to play the game mm-hmm. uh so then it's about how do you play this game with all its seriousness uh but also balance it with the point that it's a game right and that that's definitely a dilemma it's like a paradox of sort which is if like i don't know how to explain the paradox but right. you know this is a paradox that i see repeating in other places as well which is tell me tell me if this makes sense yeah. to your uh, i have found and this is this this was my great escape from nihilism right and i mean i still prefer the term nihilist to, to describe myself almost in a provocative way but i found that once i understood the profound extent of my limitation mm-hmm. i understood the profound extent of my liberation and it's exactly that once i realized and you know i don't even i don't even buy into what your idea is entirely i just tell myself as a lie an active lie that this is a simulation that this is a video game because what that does is it sets me free now mm-hmm. i can play whatever the fucking game i want to play and now i can pick and choose where i want to invest my time energy and resource in right because since there is no top down divine order mm-hmm. there is no proper blueprint of playing this now that i realize all of this is so deeply meaningless yeah i can do whatever the hell i want and it's paradoxical in that sense it's best expressed in poetry that's why yes. i don't know if philosophy is is like the right word to 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 demarcate what you essentially do i think mm-hmm. it has more poetic elements in it because it touches upon paradoxes quite explicitly yep yep that's true did did this realization that space is fake <laughs> on a more casual level come across when you were just like sitting and getting high or something what is there a psychedelic involvement in this entire phenomenon i'm very curious so i'm i'm sure there's no direct psychedelic involvement which is i wasn't i wasn't faded and you know just like looking out and i'm like wait that's that fake air is glitching like that chair is <laughs> fucking glitching i'm like what is happening <laughs> it was But more of, are you uh uh-huh, go ahead <laughs> Yeah, it was more of like a slow slow burn where it's like okay like um i am questioning a lot of things about my career the kind of things that i want to be doing in life the things that so far have been told to me that are real absolutely real these are the things you should be doing uh and after questioning them i realized wait i can do this the other way so what's the full extent of that right but again um and tell me because you 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 were very explicit in your idea that you don't want to take a prescriptive position when it comes to this phenomena but i find that this phenomena has very direct value to anybody who comes across it and is able to you know let's say wear that dress you know mm-hmm. but uh do you think for anybody who might be listening in that there is here's how i say it when i when somebody comes to me and they ask me if they should consider doing psychedelics i i tell them you need to do your homework you need to meditate for a while before you go about doing psychedelics because they can be dangerous and they can be risky and they can be very scary if you're not in control of the way you think mm-hmm. right there is a homework involved there is a detour involved before you go down the actual path do you think as far as this is the actual path a detour of some nature of understanding more primitive elements of reality is important before you you know wrap your head around this idea this all, that all of this might be a grand video game hmm i think it's i think different people search for meaning in different places um and we're sort of predisposed to look in certain places based on um based on what our inclination is so for example a lot of people might actually find meaning through religion um hmm. you know but if for example because of the way you've been brought up or your i wouldn't call them biases but just your experiences with religion might make you the kind of person that you're like this this is bs right mm-hmm. which is then you would find meaning in something else um so i would say in that way there are no prescriptions because mm-hmm. religion might actually be right for someone mm-hmm. psychedelics might actually be right for someone or mm-hmm. just becoming um really like just reading a lot for example might actually give somebody an insight that then leads them down a certain way right and that's i think the danger with prescriptions which is there is no one size fits all hmm. and the minute you prescribe something you're you're sort of baking in your ex- assumptions about why this method is the right method hmm. so the point is not 
to stick to a method but it's to overcome the need for methods overall right yeah right in within within that same paradigm of you know organically coming up with where you find meaning belief faith where you find values you know all of that um i have a certain belief value faith slash whatever you might want to call them that might be in direct contradiction to what you're saying and so tell me what you think about it edmund yeah. burke was a i'm given to assume was a german philosopher he was what is the typical definition of a mad scientist hair going everywhere just like doing crazy social experiments and what not and he was uh my martin heidegger's teacher so you know heidegger the great 20th century philosopher learned directly from edmund burke and edmund burke has only had only a handful of good concepts to tell the world and one of them was that invariably all human activities predispose towards finding certainty that we like objectivity so much that we created a whole discipline out of it called science and then we divided it into sub disciplines and then from there sub disciplines mm. and all that jazz right that the very fact that mathematics emerged with philosophy early on was a transition we made from the subjective experience that can be exp- that that can be expressed in language to an objective experience that can only be expressed in mathematics and math so this this move towards certainty is the move towards mathematics and and we as a function of generating certainty for ourselves in our life latch on to all these unreasonable beliefs and these unreasonable beliefs and this is now now I'm in ex- extended territory now I'm extending work now these un- these uh, these these beliefs could be of the nature of a divine old man sitting in the sky or these na- or this could be the belief that evolutionary wisdom has everything to do with how a modern person might operate or this might have to do with something like what you were saying mm. that space is fake and so do you think that on some level your motivation towards believing in something like this is to establish some amount of certainty a novel certainty mm. certainty to to you um do you would you say on a candid sure, level i think that's a very spot on uh, observation which is most most uh, like i don't want to make a general statement about how we're moving towards entropy or whatever but right. i think most things in i'm going to talk from my own experience most things in my life have always left me a little bit away from what from being a perfect experience where i'm just like this was great but uh, where's the meaning in this right mm-hmm. um and i feel like religion for example used to be a framework for a lot of people science is the de facto framework for today for most of modern civilization mm. uh, but i think that framework is falling short in a couple of places which is i don't think science has all the answers mm. but then at the same time anything that science is not able to answer yet is labeled pseudo science right which mm-hmm. which is not to say that it's and pseudo in for pseudo science it's not that it's not um, that it's totally false it's just that it can't be verified with the scientific method but then the scientific method is not all there is so that is sort of what i'm trying to discover right a way that i can make sense of it to myself uh, and that's about it like i'm not here to convince anybody of it right the scientific method um is again the same thing it's this um, it's this transmutation of what is subjective into a metacognitive consensual objective so a metacognitive thought is i have a x thought and i look at that thought and analyze what is my confidence judgment about this thought am i correct or am i wrong is a metacognitive thought now say i include abhinav in it and i include shay in it and i include everybody else around it and we create a system of having a consensual meta agreement Mm. and that is what the scientific method dictates so you have to be skeptical you have to falsify a hypothesis all those all that is essentially a uh, consensualized way of creating objectivity and you are right and i think the biggest problem with using science as the gold standard for any kind of a behavioral metric even though part of my enterprise is based around talking about ideas from science <clears throat> is the is the idea that science can tell you facts but we cannot make values out of facts the very so think about our current political situations right across the globe and i don't mean the destability the instability in india instability in india but i mean around the globe we follow what a democratic system and the democratic system is predicated on the idea that every life has value right where is that how how do you derive that logically how do you derive that philosophically you don't it's a divine principle the idea is that all life is given to us by god and therefore it shall be preserved and then we extend it further using logic so the, the, the the fact of the matter is that i think what what people ignore when it comes to religion is the idea that religion got the chronology right you create values first and then you assess facts you don't do it the other way around and we haven't come up with say 
a better upgrade on religion to do mm-hmm. the same. And that primarily, I think, is the conflict between religion and science in this moment. I, I've been, um, I, I recorded a podcast on that subject that I, I'm going to put out, tell me what you think about it when I do. Mm-hmm. But how, uh, to what degree are you at liberty to talk about psychedelics? At the liberty that will let me maintain plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> which then, is which is then, a gray area. Like I'm, right. I don't know. Then let's <laughs> then let's use the word. Then let's use the word. Then let's use the word might where we can use the word right. Like where we can use certainty. So, uh, what might be your view on psychedelics? Hmm. So I would say. <clears throat> I have, I have a lot of views on psychedelics. I think in one way I see it as, uh, so this is not something I came up with. I think I, maybe Timothy Leary said this, mm-hmm. but he said that as the world moved to materialism, God presented itself as a material that humans could interact with. And that material okay. was psychedelic, right? Very Which is interesting. the fact that all of this stuff was just like loose subjective experience that you couldn't really hold in your hand. Um, the discovery of psychedelics could be fueled by that desire that mm. humankind had, that humankind mm. had to actually materialize something, right? Mm. So that's one view on it that I find super interesting. Very, that is super yeah. interesting, huh? Because you know, when I was when I came across Space is Fake, and I, I was speaking to a few of my friends who who indulge in ideas of this nature, at least peripherally, and uh, some of them have consumed uh, ayahuasca, which is the mm-hmm. top of the chain when it comes to psychedelics, and they've done retreats, proper seven day in Peru, the Amazon, just gone down there and whatnot, and they were like, oh yeah, like it, it, to them that I, the embracing of the idea was so intuitive. They were like, yes you can see that happening and from whatever limited uh, experiences I've had with it, I might be able to say that um, the illusion of life, the the concept of Maya is very, very evident. You start, somebody recently asked me, they were like, so how would you describe mushrooms? I'd be like the two times that I've done them really properly, really properly. I've forgotten who I am. Like, I don't remember what it means to be Prakar. You know, the concept of Prakar sort of erases itself for a four hour window. Mm. And then you can construct your reality anew. And in that playing field, oh my gosh, you can do wonders. Oh my God, you can do magic. But let me ask you this, okay? Now, this is the question that I'd been meaning to come to originally when we tried our our Mm. first uh, conversation. I understand your philosophical um, and let's just say the parascientific views that you have, the extension of scientific views that you have as a designer, as somebody who understands the intricacies of design, would you think if you were the creator, you would design a universe to fool its observing components? Like, you know, if, why would the universe design me if it was just to sustain an illusion? Hmm. What's think, a designer's point of view? Yeah, I think from my point of view, it's it's the idea that the fact that I'm here today, um, I'm probably not put here against my will, which is if I am here playing this game, I actually want to be playing the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for example, a lot of people might think escaping the simulation means death, right? And of course it's not. Like if you're playing a game, killing your character starts your character off again. The way to play is to actually just stop playing, like switch off the Mm. console, right? Mm. You have a desire to play, which is why you're here right now playing a game. Um, I think from that perspective, then the idea becomes, so there's this one Alan Watts um, quote about this, right? Which is Mm. actually forget that. Let me get to the Alan Watts quote, but through a different analogy, which is, let's say we do live in a simulation. The way we're going to disprove it is likely not going to be by breaking out of it. It's going to be by creating another simulation, which is going to be, which proves to us that it is possible and something which is of good enough immersion. So for example, if you played VR, it's pretty great, but you know, it's VR. Like you can tell, um, it's not real life. Not when it's porn. You can never tell. It feels like actual sex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. <laughs> Pushing that a little further, right? Which is computer systems. Like all of this shit is because of computers. Like we figured out how to firstly see all of this stuff, recreate sound, recreate images on our screens. 
um then we went to you know transmitting this across an entire network and now we're getting to a point where it's on our handheld devices and we're going to mm. immerse ourselves even further so mm. let's see a future a, a few years down the line where we have vr that's about even let's say 80 to 90% real life what might happen at this point is um it would be actually be totally acceptable for you to give up your real life and only live in vr which mm. is it's not that you're escaping reality but all of reality is in vr now which is all your friends are in vr your coworkers are in vr remote work is a trend that's coming up um you're going to be doing all this and now push that another couple of years down the line it's we're going to be creating the realities we want to live in so based on your desires you're going to live in a vr world where let's say you have a lot of money you have a lot of chicks right you have all the desires that you didn't sort of fulfill um and now you have these computers that's a tool it's a tool that you've created um this very advanced humans we've now created this tool that can now satisfy all our desires very likely that now you're in the simulation you run this five times 10 times and you're going to get bored of the game what that might lo- end up looking like is you want to play a game where you forget that you're playing hmm. right and when you forget that you're playing that's proper immersion that's full immersion right like even today when i play pubg on my phone every once in a while like i forget where i am right it's a very immersive game but that played out to full immersion i'm going to play a game where i'm forgetting that i'm playing and that's what life today might just be mm. um mm. yeah right i mean but the reason why i asked you about as a designer how you think about it um is because if i was a designer if i was the grand creator and if i was to design a simulation where everybody could live in i am very sure i would make it far less painful you know what i mean like wouldn't i want to optimize for the experience of its constituents why would i make it such because you, so here is the beautiful part about things if you start using the technological metaphor for biological existence it makes so much tremendous sense it makes like the very fact i was this is this metaphor i used recently is that sex is the human equivalent of battery that it preserves or like the animal equivalent of battery because it preserves life it preserves mm-hmm. the running engine right and once you start looking at it like that it becomes very very profound but if 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 i was to create a reality i would not have all these people just suffering out of their existence where the base state like buddha says is that of dukkha is that of suffering why would a designer in his sane mind want to torture its constituents i think it's a it's a basic matter of iteration right which is if you've ever designed games you know that there's a certain image that you have in your mind where i actually want the game to be like this or oh, actually not a game anything actually a podcast or an app an actual game all forms of creation you have an image of it in your mind where you're like i actually want it to be like this and i think people will enjoy it the minute mm-hmm. you put out the first episode you get feedback now you're like okay like this is not something i had considered but i'm going to work that feedback in 10 episodes down it looks very different from how you initially started you're iterating towards a certain point where it it's good for you but it's also good for the people who are watching the people who are playing that 10 cycles of iteration played out 100 times 1000 times 100000 times right millions of times like you're in the simulation you're creating these simulations for yourself it's mm. going to reach a point where what you what we have today this probably a very good reason for it which is um there was probably a simulation that we ran earlier that had everything that and everybody was happy but for some reason that didn't cut it like and i don't know what that reason is mm. Hmm. would you say that that reason might be within your model and i'm throwing a guess out would be to maintain this illusion right so like when things were very happy we suddenly were like oh my gosh this looks like it's a simulation like could could that be a part of your yeah. model yeah it could and right? i think so within it could mm-hmm. be the fact that we actually don't live in one simulation this could be one of the simulations we're trying out for size Mm-hmm. right so very interesting that adds a whole different yeah. level of meaninglessness <laughs> to my existence <laughs> yeah but uh within your model of 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 the nature of reality what role am i playing in creating my reality what role are the constituents the members of the simulation playing in in constructing this video game is there is there anything or is it all determined you mean the people 
outside of yourself yeah i mean you and i so if there is one we know is the grand creator who's the participant who sets the stage up am i even am i just a a robot acting or like how how much control do i have over the simulation yeah so i think that's that's the very interesting part which is we actually have full control to some mm-hmm. extent because when you imagine a simulation we generally imagine it as um you know very deterministic uh but there's this one really um have you heard have you seen the concept of cellular automata no so there was this very interesting thing called conway's game of life right where this guy actually set up the cellular automata which is all it's all it is is just black and white grids um mm. it's either an on state or an off state each grid mm. right mm. and what he does is he sets up simple conditions for example i will start with this area being black this area being white or maybe in a grid checkered format and then right. every time the every time the cell next to it is black you should change to white and he sets up a bunch of these simple rules and then he hits play right and these are actually simulations that you can play with online hmm. you can actually set all these characters and you can hit play what ends up happening is out of these simple set of rules a lot of complexity evolves which is you hit play you expect it to go a certain way but then this simulation playing out right conway's game of life for a minute for 5 minutes for 10 minutes you start seeing these emergent patterns of mm. things that you wouldn't have predicted and it's different every time so simplicity can give rise to a lot of complexity complexity right so i think Any the variations it's sort of like the rules of the game are coded but we as individuals actually do have um free will in some sense. right i was going to ask so you fall on the side where you think we have a considerable amount of free will yeah john wheeler uh one of the more prominent physicists in the quantum domain had a paper to the extent and he called it it from bit mm-hmm. where he's talking about something similar where yes no agreements are the foundation of what forms the complexity so the it the observable comes from the information which is predicated on a yes no response over many many yeah. simple uh fundamentals and then they combine to create all this complexity and i think i referred to that in my paper as well the one that you read and i don't know if you ever went ahead and checked out the references but you i think that would that would do well with this this uh idea that you have but it also your your model which is where we are still swimming also begs the question as to how you consider where do you place evolution within your model where does the evolutionary theory fit in i think evolution is a form of iteration hmm. uh, which is if you consider that so here's the thing right here's where it gets into conspiracy theory territory which is <laughs> the minute you open it up to saying this is a simulation all bets are off hmm. which is for example there's this other conspiracy theory which says that all of history is fake Hmm. which is everything that we know has actually been implanted into the world and into collective memory and that's why we think we've gone past hundreds of years in the past right versus the universe actually started yesterday hmm. right um so do i lost my train of thought what was the question <laughs> no 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 the the, yeah. the the question was how do you fit evolution into the picture and you right. you started right right so you want to continue so with evolution i think it's a process of iteration which is evolution i think does tell you um how things have evolved which is mm. you can tell that it's it's usually a very see evolution is also a little crude to me which is it boils everything down to mating preferences and then this being passed on or not right okay. but there is between that 0 and 1 of will you mate or will you not there's a lot of complexity right and most human big questions fall between that complexity so evolution to me is the process of iteration right in this iteration um i i i would call it a self driving iteration too like an algorithm that's set to preserve itself that's the only yeah. function that it has right but it in this in this process of setting itself up for future survival there is uh, a trade off between benefits and costs i would keep a certain feature over generations because it has a benefit that is greater to me than the cost yeah. and what i'm getting at with laying out this formula is the biggest question in all of evolutionary history which is why the hell would we evolve something like a conscious experience true or are you within your model is there an evolution 
is there an emergent consciousness or is is there an a priori a given consciousness the fact that because we are life we are already conscious and how, how do you make sense of that yeah i think that's where evolution sort of falls short because evolution is just like yeah uh, mating preferences environment and this is why it went forward but if you apply that as a heuristic to then see like what where are we today right there's actually no or maybe there is but there is no reason for us to think about the simulation let's say hmm. right um that that actually might be harmful to the species if everybody's <clears throat> like fuck it let's just sit down and not do anything hmm. so that would actually be then be the uh, the system isn't preserving itself and another word for the system preserving itself is the simulation keeping itself running which hmm. is if everybody breaks out of the simulation the simulation is actually it actually loses its purpose right right in real life for example simulations are usually run like for example a physics simulation is run to actually play out what would happen if hmm. or let's say a let's say you're constructing a big bridge and of course you don't want the bridge to collapse at some point so you run simulations on what could go wrong right and if right. that simulation actually didn't do its purpose um there'd be real world consequences so right. actually don't know why evolution evolved us to a point where we can actually question the nature of reality so mm-hmm. in terms of consciousness then um there is probably some purpose to consciousness mm-hmm. there is a very interesting i think he's an evolutionary biologist and i think i mentioned it to warren but i got the name wrong then his name's donald hoffman mm-hmm. um and donald hoffman has a very mathematical conception of reality derived from the evolutionary forces mm. that makes the case that what we see is almost like um a first approximation is almost like this this weird um so the example he uses is what i'm seeing now for abhinav is like the desktop icon for word right that is not the icon is not the file the icon is a representation of that file Yeah. and we are evolved to have only that much approximation because that is all survival needs of us right and another way to say that and maybe you would resonate with this is that the map is not the territory and what we are allowed is the map not the territory yeah. in our perception right um, and and th- th- that makes a fairly strong case for why uh, or, or not for why we would evolve but how hmm. the evolutionary conception of a simulation argument of of the maya argument might look like yeah and i think very it's interesting, interesting because people in the startup land know this very inherently like in startup land you are constantly told to never just never have biases firstly and always think from first principles mm-hmm. which is just because something worked for somebody else does not mean it will work for you right the map is not the territory is actually a big um one of the beliefs people in startups have like you know across geographies so and you know hacking their system hacking the systems that actually exist using first principles has gotten them a lot of economic benefit so for example let's say let's look at taxis right at as an outsider you might believe that the system that it is cannot be overthrown but the whole idea of disrupting right that uber did that travis did was the fact that i can actually think from first principles build up my own systems that are way more efficient than the current existing systems and i get an economic incentive out of it so mm. breaking the simulation then becomes the ultimate mm. <laughs> the ultimate startup founder's dream which is like okay like everything can be disrupted what's mm. the biggest thing that can be disrupted we've done taxis we've done travel we've done we've done enterprise software we've done communication right mm-hmm. what's bigger and i feel like collectively we are going to evolve to that point where you know we figure it out so what is what is as a as some sort of a man who's who's let's say floating within the startup ecosphere what is what is that you want to disrupt what is so dear to you that you'd rather fuck up and burn it to hell so you know you can make it better i think it's a matter of uh, see i don't have a very strong uh, case for let's say taxis right I, mm. i couldn't i couldn't care less about what the taxis or like the f- restaurants food delivery in india is mm. and a lot of like for some certain parts of my life 
actually combined these two things, which is my search for meaning and then my search for meaning in my work. Hmm. And I was like, okay, like I can do this thing, but what's the real meaning behind this? Like, why should I do it? And I would always sort of hit a wall where I'm just like, this is not worth doing. But then as a creator, you can't get that let, you can't let that get to you. Like you have to be creating because creating the first version is how you will iterate to the second and that will lead you to the third and then you will reach number 300, which was the thing you were supposed to do. Uh, so the thing that I'm doing is actually just iterating through life. Mm-hmm. And that might involve some principles of experimentation, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me about that because I mean, now we're sort of shifting gears. Uh, there is, let's say a common playing field that both you and I are, are a part of. And a lot of that has to do with our proxy associations with Avalon to whatever extent. Right. Yeah. Um, and there is enough very hungry men in the Avalon army, guys who want to do something with their lives. And I see them taking grand risks. I see them, I see them being very ready to take on life as is right. I'm inviting you to do something prescriptive. I mean, and I understand your reticence to that, but try being as safe as you can while, you know, extending yourself in the prescriptive domain. How would you suggest somebody go about experimenting? So I would say the number one thing you need to do is get your basics, right? Which is, if you're constantly every day having to think about where the money is coming from, you're not in a place where you can constantly question the reality of the universe. Right. Right. So one of the, one of the first few projects that Varun and I actually worked on was this book called pajama profit. Right. And it's a book about how do you get started with freelancing? What are the options available to you? How do you make dollars in India and use that to your advantage? And one of the reasons we wrote this book is because for both of us in college, the way we actually got started off on this path is when we figured out that we can actually make money with our minds, which Mm -hmm. is we can actually do freelance projects. We can, there are skills that you can pick up. You can actually use the internet as a lever to actually get yourself to wherever you want to be. And Mm -hmm. if we had not sort of figured that out, right, then college would have been a little more depressing, which is, you would have been like, shit, like I have placements coming up. My GPA sucks, right? Mm-hmm. My GPA and Varun GPA are both terrible. Mm-hmm. Like shit, like in, Infosys wouldn't hire us. Like what right. are we doing with our lives? Right, right, right. right. Well, so now you have money coming in. You, you're you making, you know, thousands of dollars per month, making websites for these foreign clients. Nobody else in college understands what the fuck you're up to. Mm. But that was sort of like the foundation that let us then explore further things, right? Mm. For Varun, that was setting up his own startup. For me, that was uh, eventually setting up my own startup, but also then through right timing, figuring out design in the Indian startup sphere. Like um, like when I started in 2011, design wasn't really a thing, right? Most of my projects were iOS apps for people in the US because the app store had just launched. Uh, so my prescriptive advice, like the one prescriptive advice that I always give people is figure out your basics which is you need to be able to pay the bills. You need to, through whatever means possible, get to a place where you're comfortable, not just physically, but also mentally. And once you're at this point, that's your sort of launch pad. And then you figure out what's ahead. Right. Right. That's, that's solid advice. It took me a while to understand that myself, uh, how important it is to not worry about the day to days to actually plan the years to years. You know, it's, 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 it's profound, but what is uh, the set of influences that you have? How much uh, do you have mentors? How much do you believe in mentors? What is the fundamental unit of influence in your life? Is it a team? Is it a mentor? Is it somebody, an influence? What, what, what influences you? I think at some level it was, um, I actually don't have any physical mentors or people that, um, I mean, of course there are people who've taught me a lot, uh, but the, the, the fact that I got started in design and I had to figure it all out by myself using the internet means most of my mentors were online in some form, which is, there was nobody in my college who was doing design. Um, even in the startup sphere, like it was too early in India for design to really be a thing. So my whole mindset was, okay, this is a war that I'm playing me against this college system. Who's going to win? Mm. Right. And uh, that's gotten me to this point now. And I've of course had good mentors, people that I've worked with, 
uh, but in terms of influences at this point, um, it's mostly just, I'm trying to figure things out through intuition, which is right. I read a lot. I consume a lot of content, but I always try to see how can I take that to a direct experience that I can have hmm. uh, so that it sticks longer. Hmm. How do you water the artistic side in you? I see the philosophical and the scientific. How do you water the artistic side in you? I think I've actually don't have an artistic side and I've tried to, um, what a disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, to me, I'll explain what that means also, which is to me, design is art, right? In a sense that there is a distinction between the two art is usually you're trying to do something to, um, you're trying to make a message, for example, you're trying to convey a concept that is best communicated through a different medium, right? Mm. Design is actually the same thing, but now you have, you have economic incentives usually, right? which is a screen can look great. It can be art and design, but if that screen doesn't fulfill the business goal, um, it's not good. Right. Mm. So for me, I also look at software, you know, content, like making podcasts, making videos as a form of performance art. I think that's mm. the biggest um, influence of art in my life, which is every single thing that I've worked on in the past has eventually at some point died. Mm. Like most apps don't survive. Uh, most features that you work on in apps um, within a few months, sometimes get overwritten by a different feature, right? Nothing in this sphere that we're in, even with content, hmm. um, a certain podcast, you can tell this from your analytics. The most recent podcasts probably have the most views, like the backlog just keeps going back. So every single thing I do, hmm. that's performance art, which is, I know right. that right, it, right. it's going to be ephemeral. It's going to go away at some point, but the only thing that mm -hmm. I have is the thing that I'm working on right now. Mm -hmm. Have you uh, flirted with the meditation at all? Yeah. Yeah. What kind? So I do Hatha yoga. Um, hmm. That is a, it's like a form of meditation where it's a very, it's a full body asanas type of thing. Hmm. Um, my fascination with med meditation sort of started when um, I was reading about the psychedelic uh, experiences. And one hmm. of the big sort of influences for me was um, uh, Timothy Leary and then Richard Alpert, Ram Das. He mm -hmm. has this, th he has this book called be here now mm -hmm. where, um, the background of the book is that he was a Harvard, um, professor, right. Very established. Um, eventually they started researching psychedelics and they realized that this is very different from everything else. Right. He was teaching psychology, but he was like, with my first dose of like, psychedelics, I knew what I was teaching was BS, right? Mm. This was direct experience. Mm. So it's a story of that. Um, and then he eventually went to India to figure out, is there a connection with psychedelics to, um, spirituality, right? And one of the meditation, right? Yeah. And one of the biggest, uh, one of the things he did was he met this, um, Baba Neem Crowley Baba, and, uh, he gave him psychedelics. He watched him have it and nothing happened to him. Right. Hmm. The story actually talks about the way he actually combined these two different spheres in his life into one integral thing. So hmm. um, that was actually a big influence for me because um, even today, um, the place, which is Kanchi Dham, um, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg came there, for example, um, Steve Jobs, when he came to India, that's where he went. There is some sort of connection there where the makers of the products that we use, right? If you look at technology, it's actually technology. Most of it evolved from, um, the counterculture movement in the sixties, right? A psychedelic experience exposed you to the fact that, you know, everything is connected, dude, could actually be a real thing. It could be the mm. internet. It could be these layers of protocols and eventually apps and stuff. So right. I do think there is a deeper meaning there, but uh, I don't mm. know what that is. Isn't, uh, isn't Neem Karoli Baba the same person that the Beatles visited as well? Probably, but I'm not sure. Probably. Most because likely it's, not actually. It's weird. I, I, you know, I mean, I just recently launched, as a matter of fact, I launched Prakriti Pravachan this morning itself. And 
it's an ironical take on what godmen do and i hope people catch on to that people don't actually think i'm pretending to be a godman it's but um i've never really had faith in godmen i think it's one of the most bizarre mockeries of something that could be profound something that could have been uh, interpreted in a far more sympathetic fashion um uh, godmen tend to emasculate and caricature it and it seems almost all godmen can be discarded but by me on one level or the other they've had their efficacies and they've had their downfalls but with neem karoli baba there seems to be this this very weird um, i don't know as a very weird aura about him in text he lives no more so there is no chance of meeting him my family did in fact meet him he came over to our place uh, when my my dad was younger and, and my family speaks yeah. of him very highly as well but it's weird how uh, all these guys gravitated towards the same gentleman yeah right and i'm also given to assume that uh, ramdas gave him not just a small little dose of lsd that he really, really yeah. yeah and he just sat there like a bloody uh, stone wall and just spoke to him all night something like that right yeah yeah very interesting because this concept of ephemeral that the fact that everything passes is is something that i incurred as a direct experience when i was doing my vipassana um retreat and by far one of the most fascinating experiences i've had in mm. my life um, so i see that i see that i think also that i have managed to cover every <laughs> small little um, hole and pocket in your in your theory it, i have a lot to think about do you have any questions for me i would say is this what would you say this episode is compared to all of the other episodes would you do you think the people watching this are going to be like this doesn't connect to anything or what do you think they will connect it to so the way i <laughs> i have two parts of my personality one of them is uh, what is sitting in front of you this nice little gentleman who talk to the society who talk to society like he's a regular human the other part of me is an absolute absurdist and the absurdist in me says i don't give a shit but the gentleman in me the, the more refined version of me uh, understands that my uh, the this pg radio is predicated on uh, me just exploring things that fascinate me and a lot of it ends up being on if i was doing the job of talking to every mainstream person ever i might as well have a journalism channel where i associated to right the whole idea is that i am i'm on a self exploration and everybody who wants to tag along can be along and it's because i'm interested in this subject and i've thought about it i, I hope that was communicated that i have really given it a thought that I, so it might be one of the more casual ones in the sense that people might not take it as seriously as citizenship amendment act or you know sabri mala or, or any of that for sure, but for sure. um any anybody who's interested in this bite anybody who's interested and you know what fascinates me is that since i since i discovered varun um, which was about 6 months or so ago now and and since then his network you all the other guys on telegram and so on i've discovered that india has an intellectual base of its own that it has not been let's say it's not out there as such yeah america has a very mature intellectual base america canada north america uh, even europe has they have multiple organizations that sort of you know take the charge to to produce thought leadership in some sense mm. india um, has a bunch of small players very much like yourself and hopefully myself who are trying to bring the motion forward who are trying to lead the theology of thought into a place where people can find some sense of comfort in it so it's this attempt hopefully is also to bring that facet of india out where part of it is accomplishing the idea that abhinav who's uh, just one of the most famous designers in india is also very very deep in his own personal philosophical beliefs and scientific mm. ideas and then for anybody who's interested in this toy like uh, who would call uh, i think daniel kahneman calls theories toys he says these are toys and you must you know sell them such that people can play with them as much mm. as you like to play with them and so that is sort of the attempt to 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 make it more human to make abhinav's ideas more palatable i think it fits perfectly do you think it was nice, done man. more that actually makes a lot of sense i totally agree with that i think there's always been this sort of gap of i, I don't know what to call it it's not like maybe intellectual conversations or maybe um alternative viewpoints or i don't know what the label for this is uh, right. but i've definitely felt that gap and i do see it in the telegram groups where right. people are craving for i would say maybe authentic stories maybe viewpoints that are not um mainstream and a way they can slot it into their current world view 
right the, the fact that you and i have to reach out for people like joe rogan to you know get to the get access to the the budding minds of our times to understand yeah. is is a uh, is great in one sense but a, but a travesty in another that nobody's i have tried listening to some of the more intellectual content that comes out of india i saw a debate between uh, javed akhtar and 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 sadguru about the nature of truth which you would say is the fundamental philosophical question and i was so unimpressed I mean I have respect for both of these gentlemen with respect yeah. to what they do but it just wasn't it just did not connect well with me and my enterprise is on a personal level is a hope that I can sort of catapult myself to the place where I can comment on these issues from whatever wisdom I have accumulated I like the idea when you said you know you learn out how to rent your mind to make money that's part of my attempt to sell intellectual property in the rawest crudest forms if it needs sophistication I'll do that from there but that is the general idea and through the means of it if i can connect with people like you and then have other people connect to people like you that's the greatest joy that i can find in my work yeah man for sure i think we have a common goal there and mm-hmm. i hope that for a lot of people listening this is the entrance to a rabbit hole that they can explore further hey listen do not get into that rabbit hole there is no escaping do not listen to abhinav on that <laughs> but um, i i i will I will be in India over May, June, and July, from what it looks like right now. And nice. I will come down to Bangalore, and we will have a less rushed, more intimate conversation. I don't know what you prefer. Do you prefer wine or marijuana? But we will try yeah. and make a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Plausible deniability. <laughs> <laughs> but Abhinav, you know, this has been totally fascinating. I didn't even realize we've been at it for an hour or something. I'm assuming. Nice, awesome. This has been really fun, man. Yeah. yeah thank you so much for doing this.